Well, in this lecture, we're going to be asking a question. We're going to be asking, what happens when we die? This is something that has intrigued mankind since the dawn of time. This is something which is intriguing man still today. In all walks of life, people are wondering, what is going to happen when I die? Some people have this idea of life after death. Some people have this idea of no life after death. Other people say, well, obviously there is life after death, but not only that, you can come back and be reincarnated. Well, this is the question we're going to be looking at today. What happens when you die? Now, I'd like to just make sure that one thing is very clear. When you, under, when you test a certain topic in the Bible, we need to make sure that we look at the entire Bible as to what it says about a specific topic or a subject. Topical concordances always work very well, where you can test a certain theme, like death. What does the entire Bible say about death? If Malachi in his writings is correct and he writes there that God says, I change not, well then what's said in one area of the Bible must be the same as what's said in another area of the Bible. Otherwise the Bible cannot be true. If the Bible contradicts itself by in-depth study, you realize that that's actually the case, that the Bible's contradicting itself, well then the Bible has no authority. From start to finish, the entire Bible must be in harmony with itself. And that's why we need to look at a theme or a topic and do a study on the entire Bible and see what it says. In the same way, we're going to be looking at this topic and we're going to be saying, well, what does the Bible say about what happens when we die? This is, however, a subject which, because it touches everybody and different people at different levels, we ha can't look at this just from a biblical perspective. We can't look at this and say, well, this is what the Bible says, so bam, there you have it. That's the truth. That would be dogmatic. And we can't do that. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is I'm going to split it up. I'm going to say, well, let's see where it all comes from. And what does Satan teach in his secret inner circle teachings? And then in the second half of this lecture, we're going to say, well, what does the Bible teach? Does, is it contradictory to what Satan teaches? How does this work? Life after death is an interesting subject. One thing is true, though, that we know, and that is that we are alive. What happens after death sometimes still remains a mystery. There is this graphic where I show that life happens and then it ends. What happens after death is the question. Is there life after death? And if so, are the souls that continue after death, are they cognitive? Do they have thinking ability? The one option which is readily promoted in the world is that after death, you go straight to heaven. This is uh, taken from the text word in the Bible, which we'll look at a bit later, and it's substantiated when you bury somebody, you can put their soul in heaven. Another idea is that you don't necessarily go straight to heaven, you go to purgatory first. Purgatory being a sort of a semi-hell where you can burn off a couple of those hot spots that you need to get rid of before you can actually go to heaven. There's also an idea that you can pray for people that are in purgatory and you can pray for them that they get from purgatory to heaven. The Virgin Mary in an apparition in the book, The Thunder of Justice, on page 182. Pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners. For many souls go to hell for not having someone to pray and make sacrifices for them. This is one of the guilt conscience things that is placed on the Roman Catholic members where they have to have masses said or prayers said to help their relatives and their loved ones go from purgatory to hell. You see, this is one of the challenges because what happens if you die and you don't have anyone to pray for you? Well, then you just remain in purgatory, burning off those extra bits. There is another option which is propagated in the world and that's not heaven and not hell, but it's a type of waiting room. The New Apostolics call this the 
a departed realm or the realm of the departed. This is an area where it's neither heaven, neither hell, but it's an area of the souls where they're waiting for certain things to be happening. In other places, this waiting room is depicted as the place where the ghosts would come from. This is also the area where in, in certain circles where divination is done and, and calling up of the dead would be done. They're calling them out of this place of waiting, this waiting room, the realms of the departed. There's a fourth option, and that is reincarnation. This idea that life starts and it ends, and then death starts and it ends. And then you come back into a different body. Your soul comes back. And then death comes again. And then life comes again. And life and death and life and death. The circular reincarnative process. Well, that doesn't quite make sense to me. And I used to believe in it. I studied through it and through hypnotherapy and various other things. I even went into my past lives. Which just, by the way, is, is not true. You have to go under hypnosis to be able to go into your past lives. And as we described and discussed in the last lecture, that is the point in hypnosis where you drop your cognitive ability so that information can be implanted or read by forces unseen. So in order to have to go into your past life, you have to drop your defenses. So then you don't really know who's giving you the information. With this idea of reincarnation, one just has to understand that the belief in evolution is that you're evolving to a higher plane. Or that you are somehow evolving to a higher karma every reincarnated process that you have. Look for a moment into Calcutta in India. And tell me, where were these people previously? Have they evolved from a previous plane into humanity? If so, that means that this little boy previously, if this is his next higher karma or level of karma, what was he prior to this? And this little child in Africa... Is this the new level of godliness coming through reincarnation? This doesn't make sense. In fact, none of these options make sense. How can you go to heaven directly? It doesn't quite make sense because if you were to look back down on your family and you were to see your daughter or your, who's been involved in prostitution and your son who's a drug addict and you were to look at them from heaven, heaven couldn't be quite heaven anymore. Hell neither. How can God be cruel and leave people burning in hell without having to have somebody to pray for them? The place of waiting, reincarnation. These things are questions that have been rummaging through our minds as long as we can, can think about things cognitively. What happens when we die? Well, there is a God of the living and there's a God of the dead. Let's ask a question. Who is the God of the living? Matthew 22 verse 32 says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This is repeated in Mark 12 verse 27. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Again in Luke 20 verse 38, For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. So who is the God of the living? Jesus Christ. Who is the God of the dead? The God of the dead. Well, to, in order to understand this, we need to go back in time. We need to go back to the ancient pharaohs into ancient Egypt. Here's an image of a pyramid in Egypt. And if you just look down in the bottom left or the bottom right, you'll see these tiny specks of people. Look at the size of the people compared to the size of the pyramid. These were tombs and, and uh, worship places that were built for the sun god. This image, which is taken from Greenwich Mean Time, hints towards that exact thing. Somehow the sun is involved in pyramids and in, uh, in Egypt and the worship of pagan gods. Well, history tells us that immortality, or the immortality of the soul for that matter, is a pagan doctrine which was taught and accepted by ancient Egyptians. This is what they believed. And Osiris was the one who was involved at death. These images show Osiris as the one with the seat of the judge. As the judge. Not only that, you'll see next to him the all-seeing eye. Remember we discussed the all-seeing eye of Osiris? And Blavatsky told us that the eye of Osiris is the same as the eye of Shiva. This all-seeing eye supposedly that you have here in the middle of your forehead. We'll get into that in a later lecture. 
Remember the pagan priestess putting the eye of Shiva or the dot of Shiva, the awakening of the third eye on Pope John Paul II? Well, this is somehow an indication that there might be some connection between ancient Egyptian pagan religions of sun worship and Osiris, as we know, coming through into something to do with the dead. Let's have a look at a website, ancientegypt.co.uk. It says Osiris was the god of the dead and the rule of the underworld. In the glossary it explains that the place or the underworld is the place where a dead person's soul would go to be judged. The ancient Egyptians believed that a person's soul would have to pass a series of tests in the underworld before they were allowed to enter the afterlife where they would then live forever. This is continued on this quotation. It says, Osiris was the ancient Egyptian god of the dead and the god of the, of the resurrection into eternal life. He was the ruler, the protector, and the judge of the deceased. Question. Who is the god of resurrection into eternal life, as we know it from our experiences and from what we've learned in the previous lectures? That's Jesus Christ. So here Osiris is claiming the same authority and positioning as Jesus Christ. Not only that, he says, I am your protector, I am your ruler, and I am the judge. All of those belong to God. So Osiris is claiming to be God. Let's read from Wikipedia what it says about Osiris the Ram God. It says, as God of the dead, Osiris' soul, or his Ba, was occasionally worshipped in a rite of its own almost as if it were a distinct god, especially so in the delta city of Mendes. This aspect of Osiris was referred to as the Baneb Jed, which literally means the bar of the Lord of the Jed, which roughly means the soul of the Lord of the pillar of stability. Since the bar was associated with power, and also happened to be a word for ram in Egyptian, Baneb Jed was depicted as a ram or as a ram-headed. A living sacred ram was even kept at Mendes and worshipped as the incarnation of the god. In occult writings, Banab Jed is often called the goat of Mendes and identified with Baphomet. Okay, so all of that information means that somehow Osiris and his soul was sometimes even worshipped separately, called the Ba, the soul of Osiris. And this was depicted as a ram, and in the city of Mendes, they had a goat, and this goat represented the, what's known as the goat of Mendes, or the, the um, soul of, of Osiris that was worshipped as a god. So this goat of Mendes, according to this encyclopedia, was known as, or identified with, Baphomet. Who's Baphomet? Well, here we go. Let's ask Wikipedia again. You mentioned this Baphomet figure, please tell us who he or she is. A well-known depiction shows Baphomet in the form of a winged humanoid goat with a pair of breasts and a torch on his head between his horns. This image comes from Eliphas Levi, who was a Satanist and a 33rd degree Freemason. He depicted the image that they were worshipping at the time was this, identify, was this being identified as Baphomet. This is a goat figure with a, a torch or a light between his head, or between the horns on his head. And interestingly enough, he was male and female. He had breasts and a male sex organ. This is the combination of good and evil. The combination of, of dark and light, black and white. The combination of male and female. And it's also known as the light bearer, the one that carries the torch. Baphomet, being a winged goat, is a representation of Lucifer. It's a representation of Satan himself, combined as a male-female humanoid goat, in this form as drawn by Eliphas Levi. This image explains in Wikipedia that Levi called this image the Baphomet of Mendes. However, the deity was actually a ram deity, Banep Jed, who was the Ba of Osiris. So Osiris' soul, when they were worshipping him, or it, was worshipped as Baphomet, the Banep Jet, the soul of Osiris. And this Baphomet was basically Lucifer. Let's check what Alistair Crowley, who is known as the most wicked man that ever lived, 33rd degree Freemason, a Satanist and a cruel, cruel man, he said, 
that, well, it is written at least about him in The Law is for All. Alistair Crowley identified Baphomet with what he called the lion serpent. Crowley writes, The devil is the serpent, Satan. He is life and love. He is light and his zodiacal image is a Capricornus, the leaping goat, the Godhead. So Baphomet is Satan. Baphomet is the soul of Osiris. Osiris is the judge of the dead. So who's the god of the dead? Osiris is another name for Baphomet or another description. And Baphomet is another description of Satan. So the god of the living would be Jesus Christ. The god of the dead would be Osiris or Satan. Genesis has a very interesting story about what really happened in the beginning of time. Genesis 2 verses 16 and 7 read as follows. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Satan turned this around in Genesis and explains that he said, Oh, are you really sure? Is God that cruel and so unkind as to, to hide something from you? Are you not really allowed to have the knowledge of good and evil? Oh, what a cruel, cruel God you have to bow down to. This is taken from the NIV, the New International Version. In Genesis 3 verse 1 it says, Now the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Not only does Satan contradict God's law and God's commandment, don't eat of it. He says, you can eat of it. God said, you're going to die. You're not going to die. That's the contradiction. He then inserts his own ideas, his own theology, and he says, you're going to become like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And how does Satan, in the beginning of time, in the Garden of Eden, how does Satan get people to accept this incorrect theology? He uses their senses. Genesis 3 verse 6 explains this. It says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, she took and did eat. What deceived her? What did Satan lean on to get uh, Eve to accept this new false doctrine? He said, well, check for yourself. Does it look like it's evil to eat this fruit? Well, once she saw that it was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and looked like it was going to make her wise, once she had the, the physical or the sensory confirmation that what he was saying was true, well, then she took an ate. So in the, throughout history, even in the Garden of Eden, Satan used senses, man's senses to deceive. Now, it's, it, in the Garden of Eden, Satan teaches the first lie about immortality. You're not going to surely die. God said you're going to die. You won't die. You actually become like God. So there's this idea of immortality. What does the world currently believe today? We just have to look into the headlines and see Billy Graham on the top of one of the news headlines that says, How to contact your loved ones in heaven. Well, as we've just explained, that doesn't quite make sense. How can you contact your loved ones in heaven according to the story in the Old Testament or the story in the New Testament at least about Lazarus and Abraham? There's a divide. The one can't cross to the other. But how do you contact your loved ones in heaven? Well, John Edward, who we know from TV, is John Edward McGee Jr. is a television personality and a performer who claims that he is a psychic medium who can communicate with the dead. The son of a policeman, Edward was raised a Roman Catholic and later became non-practicing. Ed, John Edward has an uncanny ability to predict future events and communicate with those who have crossed over to the other side. And please note, other side is a capital O, capital S. So it's the idea of a superior element of living compared to where we are today. This John Edward type idea is spread all over the television, spread all over the world. Just believe in life after death, come to a seance or some other type of contact and we'll be able to communicate with them. Well, 
let's look at where this idea of spiritualism or life after death, the eternal immortal soul, where did this all come from? Where was it confirmed and how does it work? Well, modern spiritualism started with the Fox sisters. Beginning at around the middle of March 1848, the Fox family began to be disturbed by strange sounds and activities. The children were so alarmed at what was happening that they refused to sleep apart and were taken into the bedroom of their parents. Here what was happening was some sort of poltergeist phenomenon, some sort of realization that there was something in their house that was making certain noises, bangings and, and possibly walkings and knockings and tappings. And obviously they were pretty fearful. They didn't quite understand what was going on. Let's read on. This is from their own website, fst.org. This is them saying it themselves, the Fox sisters. My youngest child, Kathy, said, Mr. Splitfoot, do as I do, clapping her hands. The sound instantly followed her with the same number of raps. When she stopped, the sound ceased for a short time. Here, the daughter, the youngest child, a daughter, I think, the youngest child, Kathy, she says, Mr. Splitfoot, so... There's the, the child recognizes somehow that this entity is associated with a split foot. Who's got a split foot? Which animal? Well, a goat has. She says, Mr. Splitfoot, do as I do. And she clapped her hands and the sound wrapped exactly what she had just clapped. Finally, on March 31st, Kate Fox made history. She challenged the mysterious unseen power. She said, well, if this power can clap according to what my daughter is saying, well, let's see how far we can take this. Quoting from their own information, it says, I then thought I could put a test that no one in the place could answer. I asked the noise to wrap my different children's ages. Successively, instantly, each one of my children's ages was given correctly, pausing between them sufficiently long to individualize them until the seventh, at which a longer pause was made. And then three more emphatic raps were given, corresponding to the age of the little one that died, which was my youngest child. Somehow this spirit entity knew the ages of all of her children, and individually and successively they were able to identify and make known that the spirit entity knew how old they were. Not only that, the spirit entity knew how old the child was when it died. She says, I then asked, is this a human being that answers my question so correctly? There was no rap. I asked, is it a spirit? If it is, make two raps. Two sounds were given as soon as the request was made. My husband went and called in Mrs. Redfield, our nearest neighbor. She's a very candid woman. I asked a few, I asked a few questions for her and was answered as before. He told her age exactly. Then she then called her husband, and the same questions were asked and answered. Many people who were fishing in the creek and all heard the same questions and answers. Many remained in the house all night. It was said that there were over 300 persons present at the time. This is signed Margaret Fox, April 11, 1848. So during this period, these wrappings that had started to scare the children and scare them in their own house, they took it on and they challenged the wrappings to identify who is it that's wrapping. Is it a spirit entity? Bam, yes. A soul or a, a, an extra immortal part of a human being that has died or that has continued after death. Not only that, this soul, this, this spirit entity, knew all the information, not only about them and their children, but about the neighbors and about every single person, even 300 people that were in that house that evening. Quite phenomenal. Where does the spirit entity get all this information? The following statement appeared in the Boston Journal, which is a non-spiritualist paper on November 23rd, 1904. See, what had gone on is they had said, or they had, the Fox sister had claimed to be in communication with the dead. And they had said, well, this is obviously the soul of a human being that has survived death and is now trying to communicate back with us. They then tried to def find who had died, where's the remnant, the remains, the, the body, the bones. How, do we, how can we prove that this is a soul? Let's find the body. Well, this article appeared in the Boston Journal. 
Rochester, New York, November 22, 1904. The skeleton of a man supposed to have caused the rappings first heard by the Fox sisters in 1848 has been found in the walls of the house occupied by the sisters and clears them from the only shadow of doubt held concerning their sincerity in the discovery of spirit communication. What did Satan use in the Garden of Eden to deceive Eve? Her senses. Here the Fox sisters were, you, were experiencing a sensory stimulation. They were hearing some noises and there were certain things happening in their house. This is the confirmation of what they were thinking through their senses. But even so, over time people doubted it because they didn't have the confirmation of physically seeing a body and therefore being able to associate the body with the soul. And then they found the body and boom, everything was confirmed. They now believe that this was the body of the soul that was communicating through these wrappings. It is reported that Mrs. Fox's hair turned white because of these occurrences. Kate had to move to her brother's house in Auburn, New York, while Margaret took refuge at her sister's house in uh, Leah's house in Rochester. Interestingly, though, raps broke out at both of those places. They followed them, and it was determined that they were carrying the energy in order to make these wrappings occur, for the spirit to manifest as it did. Well, the violent disturbances continued, and they continued to become more and more violent. From wrappings, they started to become bangings, from bangings to clashings, and they got more and more violent. Until at Leah's house, a friend remembered that the girl's brother, David, had once conversed with the Hydesville spirits using the alphabet. And what they did is they laid out an alphabet and they said, well, say for example, one rap would be A, two raps would be B, three raps would be C, four raps would be D, etc., etc. And then they laid this out and in an experiment they tried this method with the following results. The spirit power, the spirit entity it dictated to them a letter. It reads as follows. Dear friends, you must proclaim this truth to the world. This is the dawning of a new era. You must not try to conceal it any longer. When you do your duty, God will protect you and good spirits will watch over you. This was the letter dictated to them by the Spirit. They were getting a command to take this truth that they had experienced into the world and tell the whole world about the life after death that has been confirmed through their experiences. Well, the successful message that was, or transference of this message from this spirit world into these people or to these people caused these violent rappings to subside. Apparently, this, there was a certain frustration in the spirit world or in the spirit specifically where it was trying to get this information out and trying and trying and becoming more and more violent. And then when it was finally able to give out this information, a more orderly and cohesive form of communication was established. So from that point on, as BBC News explains, science and seance, the world's most eminent scientists are, usually, are not usually associated with the dim-lit surroundings of a clairvoyance parlor. But some of science's biggest names have not only dabbled in, but been entirely convinced by the world of the seance. This is confirmation that uh, in 2005, people are still battling with us. How does science fit in with us? We, can, we can't prove it scientifically, but boy, man, this looks convincing. And the gravestone at the Fox sisters' house now says, The birthplace of modern spiritualism. Upon this site stood the Hydesville Cottage, the home of the Fox sisters, through whose mediumship communication with the spirit world was established March 31, 1848. There is no death. There are no dead. Who said that? God or Satan? There is no death. God said, well, if you eat of that, you're going to die. Satan said, if you eat of that, you're not going to die. So who's speaking this? Is this serpent language or God language? Well, let's go into the serpent world for a moment. Let's go back to the satanic high priest that we've quoted over the last couple of days. Let's read what Satan says to his high priests. 
How does this work from a satanic perspective? Let's expose what is hidden inside there, and then we'll compare it to what the Bible says. One topic that my friend Roland spoke about with great enthusiasm was his new interest in the supernatural. He told me how fortunate he was in having become acquainted with a group of people who were the members of a society that communicated with the dead. This is the author now speaking about how he had become involved with people that had communicated with the spirits of the dead. He continues, While it was interesting to hear Roland's experiences with the supernatural, they gave me a weird feeling. Then he asked me whether I would be interested in attending one of their seances. Maybe the medium could have you talk to the spirit of your dead mother. You would like that, wouldn't you? During the evening, the subject had come up that both of us had been in the merchant navy during the war. And this is when the spirit was called up. The spirit medium had conjured up the supposed spirit of Roland's co-workers, one of Roland's co-workers who had perished when the ship they were on sank. Not only was when they went to the seance, not only was this spirit medium able to confirm that they were in the merchant navy, but he was able to confirm the, name of the, the names of the people that had perished and he called up the spirit speaking and sounding like the spirit of that person that had died. Now, one of the things that happened is this spirit medium, later on in the evening, started to make some contradictory statements. Not only that, the person who was with them started to ask, what I mean to say is, how long have you been pretending to hold communication with the dead? Well, the author says, not very long for me, I replied. Then this guy continues, he says, I see where you guys have a lot to learn when it comes to the supernatural. You're both wasting your time by going to those spiritualistic seances. Don't get me wrong, they have their place. They're a good pastime for women in that they receive some sort of comfort from thinking that they're getting guidance in their lives through some departed one. Of all that he said to us, one sentence stood out in my mind. George, would you clarify the question you asked us a little while ago? How long have you been pretending to hold communication with the dead? What do you mean by the word pretending? He smiled, glanced at his watch and said, well, it's too late to explain that one tonight. But let me tell you this, you have not been talking to the dead. And then he went back to discussing his personal success. So here's somebody involved in seances, somebody involved in speaking to the dead. But interestingly enough, at the same time he's involved in demon worship, says, no, we know that it's got its place, we know it works, but actually... They're not speaking to the dead, and neither were you. But they've just experienced it. What do you mean we're not speaking to the dead? He then, this gentleman goes into a long explanation about demon worship. He even explains, the, the author now explains, what he saw in this worship room of the gods. These various paintings that had been made. As a demon would manifest itself as a human being, they would then paint this human being, and that painting would be put up in life-size form. And the people could then go and worship at these, the, what's called the demon worship room or the worship room of the gods. Not only that, Satan himself had appeared and had drawn, was, uh, had stayed there long enough for his picture, his portrait to have been drawn. And interestingly, the description given is exactly as the description given by a lady who we'll discuss in a later lecture called the gift of prophecy. Exactly the same indication, high forehead, wide brow, etc., etc. Not only do these people bow down before demons, they bow down before Satan, and they say master, and they call him God. They don't call our God God. Remember, they call our God the creator. The story continues. It says, while we were looking at the various altars and these paintings, this, now the satanic high priest explained that the demon spirits are in reality specialists in various fields of activity. Having a background of experience measured in millenniums, they are engaged in a fierce conflict for the control of men's minds, a conflict against the forces from above. When Roland wondered why the spirits were spending so much time or so much effort to deceive humanity, the priest stated that everyone they could make to disqualify themselves or himself from being a member of Christ's kingdom automatically became a member of Satan's great kingdom and that he would, before long, establish on earth. 
Those who went down into the grave under Satan's leading, he would someday restore to life. Christ and his followers, he said, in, intended to end the intense struggle between the two great forces by raining fire from heaven upon Satan's followers. But it wouldn't hurt them because demon spirits could now control fire so that it had no power to burn human beings. And he added, if I doubted what I was saying, I could go to India or across to the other areas of the world who had perfected black magic to a science and I would behold firewalkers stepping across beds of coals without so much as singeing the hair on their legs. If you're wondering where this idea of firewalking as a motivational tool within business comes from, it comes from demons who are, are what they call energizing or protecting certain human beings who come under the influence as you psych yourself up and you work your way towards being able to walk over these coals. Don't be fooled. You're busy dealing with things that will be explained in a later lecture. As we left the worship room, this, this is now the worship room of the gods, this demonic place of worship. I stated that I felt quite confused about Satan and his angels. My Catholic upbringing had taught me that Satan and his angels were in hellfire with the souls of the people who had died in the state of mortal, mortal sin. What was the truth? This was the question that was going on in his mind. I've been taught that you go to hell or you go to heaven. Where do these souls come from now? Aren't they, are they in hell? Well, then they wouldn't be speaking like that. If they're in heaven, well, they wouldn't come back. This was the question. The satanic high priest continues. When it became known that his rival, Christ, would come to earth after assuming the nature of man to attract humanity to himself, our master, that is Satan, and his chief counselors, those are the demons, decided to follow a strategy similar to that one er that originally had enabled them to acquire their new dominion. This planned course of action would require all demon spirits to carefully counsel humans to live in a way that would disqualify themselves from becoming members of Christ's kingdom. The spirits would encourage people to listen to their feelings instead of the word of Christ and his prophets. In no sure way could the spirits obtain control of people's lives without the individuals realizing what was happening. The spirits would suggest all kinds of erroneous doctrines and ideas and humanity would readily accept them. Why? Because they felt strongly about them. What happened next could amaze me beyond my ability to explain. I could hardly believe my ears. There, was, there it was, a voice I'd heard on the radio probably a hundred of times, hundreds of times over a number of years. Chameleon Howd or Hood was a hotly controversial politician. He never hesitated to voice his opinions regarding anyone or anything. In the late 30s, Chameleon was a hot topic for French news media. His activities as mayor of Montreal constantly made the news. It continues, and now I heard that familiar voice again, but this time reproduced through the agency of a demon spirit. We listened to it about 20 minutes. Some time ago, I mentioned the experience to someone, and the individual said, well, it could have been the departed soul or the spirit of Chameleon giving that speech. However, at the time, Chameleon was well and alive. So who was reenacting this Chameleon's voice? Chameleon was alive and well somewhere else in the world. These were demon spirits having the same knowledge and even sounding like the, the man himself. That evening as George drove us home, he stated his belief that when a person dies, he is completely dead. And that uh, when a person or when people claim to hold communication with the spirits of the dead, they are actually demon spirits impersonating their loved ones. It so happened that the following Sunday evening we discussed the topic with the priest. He gave Roland and me an interesting account of demon spirits that had been impersonating the dead. He even gave three or four biblical accounts, and since I had no knowledge of the Bible, it did not impress me, except when he mentioned the masterpiece of the experience, Saul, the king of Israel. Here, the satanic high priest, these demon worshippers, are saying, well, here's a perfect example of, of how demons have impersonated the dead. Here's four biblical examples where it's recorded in the Bible where people thought they were speaking to the dead, but actually they were speaking to demons impersonating the dead. The most important one of all time, though, they say, is the one with Saul in 1 Samuel 28, verses 1 to 15. Here Saul is... Uh, gone to a medium to call up the spirits. It says, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? 
The old man cometh up, he is covered up with a mantle. And now listen here, it says, Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground. And then, Saul, and then Samuel says, why have you brought me up? Why have you disquieted me? You see, this is the problem here. What had to happen in order for him to believe? He had to perceive that it was Samuel. It was his, his physical experience that would confirm what he was trying to believe. In the satanic worship system or in this book as it is, is, is explained by the satanic high priest, he stated how the spirits had led Saul to rule his life by listening to his feelings instead of the word of God. And how they completely separated him from the creator by causing him to commit a great abomination in the sight of God. No greater glory could our master bring to himself than, at that time in history than to leave, lead the chief executive of the nation of Israel to buy himself before a demon spirit in sight of all the inhabitants of the galaxies. This, the man said, the satanic high priest said that demonic spirits have worked through the centuries to convince people to accept the concept of humans having an inherently immortal soul. He explained how spirits have taken great delight in impersonating dead ones or famous people, all in an attempt to persuade humanity that the human personality does not perish with the body. And then this priest surprised my friend and me when he declared that a belief in life after death was a form of idolatry through necromancy. In fact, I nearly fell off my chair when he claimed that demonic spirits were continually defiling Christian churches by luring millions of Christians into a form of spirit worship that leads them into idolatry without them even realizing. Col contrary to popular belief, he continued, necromancy does not just consist of conjuring up the spirits of the dead to communicate with them. Because human beings are totally mortal and do not possess an immortal soul, necromancy has inherit in it the idea that the dead actually enter a higher existence than when they were alive. And belief in life after death itself, he argued, constitutes necromancy. It allows demonic spirits the opportunity to impersonate the dead. Well, there's a whole bunch of information. There's quote after quote after quote after quote after quote. What are Satan's demons using to defile Christian churches? What are Satan's uh, energies using to deceive mankind? Our feelings, our physical experiences, our sensory stimulation. The Bible warns about nine specific things that we mustn't do. It says not only must we not do them, but there's a reason for it. Now, were I to tell my daughter, please don't go and play in the road, Am I being cruel and unkind and horrible and trying to keep something away from her, this wonderful experience of, of playing in the road? Or am I trying to say to her, well, I know a little bit more about the situation. It might not make sense to you at this point in time, at two and a half years old, but if you do go and play in the road, I'm going to have to give you a hiding. I'm going to have to somehow correct your thinking. The Bible gives us nine specific things that we mustn't do. It says in Deuteronomy 18, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, that's walking over coals, or that uses divination, this is ast astrology, or trying to use tarot cards to predict the future, an observer of times, which is specifically astrology, an enchanter, this is Harry Potter, a witch or a charmer. Number seven, a consulter with familiar spirits. This is spirits who impersonate the dead. A wizard or number nine, a necromancer. One who consults with or believes in life after death. You don't have to call up spirits to be part of necromancy. You just have to believe in life after death because you're opening up a door where Satan can then impersonate somebody that's died. Now we know that Osiris has got all these various marketing plans. No, when you die, you go to heaven. When you die, you go to hell. Or when you die, you go to purgatory. When you die, you go to this place of waiting. When you die, you come back and you be reincarnated. These are just different marketing plans for the God of the dead. But John 8 verse 44 explains that Satan is a liar. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And Revelation 16, 14 says, And Satan deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by those miracles. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 says the following, 
For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. This is confirmed in Revelation 16 verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. How does this now work? Are you telling me we, we, we don't have life after death? No, I'm not telling you that. In the second half of this lecture, we're going to find out what does the Bible say about this? We've now spent a, a whole bunch of time finding out, well, what does Satan say about this? We know that he's the God of the dead, where Jesus is the God of the living. Satan says, well, you, not, you, you do not have an immortal soul. You, when you die, you're completely dead. And that by believing you have an immortal soul gives his demons the opportunity to impersonate people that are supposedly living on the other side. That's what Satan says. What does the Bible say? Does it confirm this? Does it contradict this? And if so, if it, if it says that we're dead, well, where have we been getting these doctrines of life after death from that have been so widely preached in these churches? I hope you'll come back with me and do a Bible study, a theme study on what the entire Bible says from start to finish about what happens when we die. 